Hi, and welcome to lecture four. This lecture is going to be the first one where we talk about sequential logic. Up until now, we've just been talking about combinational logic. And in this lecture, we're going to cover the storage elements and the analysis of sequential logic circuits. The first part, which is this part, is going to be on the introduction to sequential logic circuits. And then we're going to talk about the storage elements such as latches and flip-flops, state tables and state diagrams for sequential logic, more and merely state diagrams, and then finally do some more detailed sequential circuit analysis. So up until now we've been talking in quite a lot of detail about combinational logic and you should be quite familiar with combinational logic circuits. The difference here in sequential circuits is that now not only do we have inputs, the combinational logic and outputs, but we have storage elements. And these storage elements are things such as latches and flip-flops. And these storage elements output states and the output state is used in combination with the inputs in the combinational logic circuit. And then up until now, our combinational logic circuits have just output some values that we've immediately shown or used. In this case, the combinational logic will also output a next state output, which are then stored in the storage elements. In the same way as before, our combinational logic circuits still have inputs, which are signals from the outside, and outputs, which are signals to the outside. So up until now, our combinational logic circuits were always expressed as some output, such as y was equal to a function of an input, for example, x. Now, with the combinational logic in sequential circuits, we have the next state being a function of both the inputs as well as the state, which is output from the storage elements. Then we have these two state diagram representations we use in sequential circuits, and these are merely and more. In the merely case, we have the outputs being a function of both the inputs and the state in the same way that the next state is also a function of inputs and state. However, with the more case, we have the output function only being a function of the state. So notice how it's not a function of the inputs. It's irrelevant what the input is. It's only relevant what the state is. We'll explain those in more detail later on in this lecture. And which output function type we use depends upon the specifications that are given to us. And it does actually affect the design significantly. We'll talk about that a little bit in this lecture and also in more detail in the next lecture. There are two different types of sequential circuits, and these are synchronous and asynchronous, very broadly. And which type it is depends upon the times at which storage elements observe their inputs and storage elements change their state. And we have to be a lot more mindful of timing with the sequential logic circuits where we weren't so concerned with the combinational logic circuits, how long it took for signals to propagate through each one of the components. In a synchronous sequential circuit, the main difference is a clock, which is considered to be separate from other inputs. And we would say that the behavior is defined from knowledge of its signals at discrete instances of time. The storage elements that we talked about before, they observe the inputs and they only save the state in relation to the timing of the signals. For example, the clock pulses from a clock. Uh, something that we would have considered before, but we haven't really focused on it. In the asynchronous case, we will consider how the behavior is defined from knowledge of the inputs at an instance of time and order in continuous time in which the inputs change. And so this is really important that you could consider the clock as just another input. And in that case, all circuits would be asynchronous. But in the synchronous case, we especially consider that there is that clock input and that it is slightly different in nature to the other inputs. And by doing that and abstracting this synchronous idea, we can make more complex designs, what we would call tractable or possible, since it allows us to handle these more complex designs. So up until now with our combinational logic circuits, we haven't really been concerned about timing. But of course, in actual fact, when a signal goes through some sort of component, let's just say a very simple inverter gate, then it does take some time for that inversion to happen. And whilst up until now, we've always assumed that the same signal propagating through an inverter gate or another gate and a wire would take exactly the same amount of time. In actual fact, that's not true. When we get down to the nanosecond level, these operations actually do take some time because there are some physical phenomenons happening that take some amount of time to finish. So in order to understand the time behavior of the sequential circuit, we use this thing called discrete event simulation. And the basic rules of 
of discrete event simulation are that we first of all model the gate as an ideal instantaneous function. That is the perfect case where gates don't take any time at all. And then we have a fixed gate delay. And this will usually be some number of nanoseconds that we add on. So when we're thinking about a signal propagating through a circuit, it's useful to have timing axis at the bottom so that we can actually see what the state of the signal is at all points in the circuit. Since it doesn't actually propagate through the circuit instantaneously, it does take some time. And then when we have any sort of change in the input value, we evaluate this modeled circuit to see if it causes any change in the output values. And then the changes in the output values are scheduled to occur with consideration of all the fixed gate delays in between the input and that output. And then after that amount of time, after that fixed gate delay, and we have the scheduled output change, then the output changes as well as any inputs that it drives. So we assume then that there's no time delay along a wire, and we assume that if we have two gates next to each other, then the signal takes no time to get to here. It takes some time to get through the gate, but once it's through the gate, it's assumed that this point and this point of the wire have exactly the same potential. There's no time for it to propagate between here and here. And then there is some more time for it to go through the gate. So here's a simulated NAND gate. And as we said before, we first of all, model it like an ideal NAND gate where the signals A and B come in and then we have this F instantaneous which is assuming that it got through here in no time at all and then we add this delay so we wait in this case 0.5 nanoseconds before we update F to equal F instantaneous. So there's a point in time at which F instantaneous is not the same as F as we'll see in this next table. So let's think about an example where we have A and B, the signals A and B, having been one for a long period of time. And then at a certain time, we'll call that time zero, between time minus infinity and time zero, A and B have been one. And then exactly at time zero, A changes to zero. So we had both A and B being one at this time zero, A changes to zero. And then we have to think about what is actually happening there. So let's look at this table, A and B, both one, the F instantaneous is obviously zero because one NAND one gives zero. F is also zero because it's been a long period of time. And then at time zero nanoseconds, A goes from one to zero. B stays at one and we say, well, what's F instantaneous? Well, now all of a sudden F instantaneous is changing to one, isn't it? So looking at this terminology, how it's written elsewhere, we've always got the one on the left and the zero on the right and then we're just directing the arrow. So in this case, since A went from one to zero, we've got F instantaneous going from zero to one and we've got F, F still stays at zero because there is some delay that's gonna take some time. In this case, it's gonna take 0.5 nanoseconds for it to get through to F. So now after 0.5 nanoseconds, A is definitely zero, B is still one, F instantaneous is one and then we can see that F has now changed from zero to one because after this delay of 0.5 nanoseconds, we're now finding that F is changing. And now after 0.8 nanoseconds, we have A changing from zero back to one again. B is still at one. Now F instantaneous, it changes instantaneously and we have it going from one, which it was to zero, but F still stays at one. So we'll have say F I changes to zero, but F stays at one. And now after a further 0.5, nanosecond delay. A is definitely one, B is definitely one, F I is zero. And now all of a sudden F is catching up and F is changing from one to zero after this 0.5 nanosecond delay. And then think about what happens as time goes on if A and B don't change. We will see that at 1.5 nanoseconds or two nanoseconds, if A and B are both one, F instantaneous is still zero and F is most definitely zero again and then continue on like that. Okay, for this next example, let's suppose we have some gates with a certain delay, t nanoseconds, and they're represented for an inverter gate being 0.2 nanosecond delay, an AND gate being 0.4 nanosecond delay, and an OR gate being 0.5 nanosecond delay. Now, this is not necessarily indicative of those gates for all possible circuits. This is for demonstration purposes for this example, but we are obviously talking in a very, very small time scale, but it can be significant, as you'll see in this next example example. 
So let's consider a two input multiplexer. Now remembering from our combination of logic circuits, we had two inputs like A and B, and then we had a selector line, which was how we decided whether we were having an input of A or B, something like given the selector line, then we decided if selector equals to zero, then it's like A is connected to Y, whilst if selector equals to one, uh, we've got Y equaling to B, which is written here. But obviously when there's actually some circuit delay on these components, then some strange things can happen. Let's consider this example where we've got A being zero for a long period of time and B being one, and the selector line is zero. So in this case, when the selector line is zero, then the output Y is equal to A, which is what we see here. We see this as the output at the bottom, input there, select in the middle. So for a long period of time, the selector was zero, therefore we were seeing at Y the value of A. So at this instant in time, we have S changing from zero to one, which means previously we would have assumed that Y would instantaneously change to be B, which is one. But obviously there's some time delay. So let's track through the state on this circuit. So up until S changes to one, we have S being zero here, and then the output of the inverter would be one. But now at this instant in time where S becomes one, then the wire takes no time to propagate. So we change this value from zero to one, but actually this still stays at one. These values all stay as is. After a further 0.2 nanoseconds, we now have the signal from select propagating through the inverter gate. So at this time, S not becomes zero where it was one before, but none of the other gates have changed. None of the other outputs from the gates have changed. After a further 0.2 nanoseconds, which is now 0.4 nanoseconds from when we first had select change, we will see another change. We will see the output of this gate here, select being one and B being one, changing to one, but none of the other outputs change. Then after a further 0.2 nanoseconds, total of 0.6 nanoseconds after we first changed select, the signal from select has propagated both through the inverter gate and also through this AND gate. And we previously had zero and we still have zero there. So it doesn't actually change any values. And now after a further 0.3 nanoseconds, which is in total 0.9 nanoseconds after the select was first changed, and also 0.5 nanoseconds from when the output of S and B was changed, we now finally have Y changing from zero to one, in effect changing from A to B. And now the signal goes along like this for a little while. We have A changing at this point, but this is largely irrelevant because the select line is still one. We have a zero here, one and zero gives zero, and we still have B being the output and the output being one. And now at this point, another interesting thing starts to happen. We have the select line changing from one to zero. It's not until this point here where select line actually changes from one to zero, in effect requesting that the output start to be B, that interesting things start to happen. And we're gonna call this T2 equaling zero. So the select line was one and changed to zero. We have B being one and the output of this one was one. We had Y equaling to one with the output of S not, the inversion of S being zero, A being one, output here being zero. And then after 0.2 nanoseconds, we have the inversion changing from zero to one. We have S being most definitely zero and none of the other outputs have changed yet. So this gate now is in the process of changing. And just before it has changed, because it would take 0.4 nanoseconds for this zero to propagate through to here, B changes from one to zero. And then after a very small amount of time, this one value changes to zero due to the S select becoming zero. Okay, now after a further 0.2 nanoseconds, which is a total of 0.6 nanoseconds from when the selector was changed, we now have this top NAND gate changing from a zero to a one. Since this zero has already propagated through, and for a while there we had zero or zero, then it's already started its journey. So if this takes 0.5 nanoseconds to get through, then this zero is already about 0.2 nanoseconds along the way through this gate and where it was zero and one for a while, and then for a very short period of time, 0.2 nanoseconds, it was zero and zero. So the zero into the OR gate now propagated about 0.2 nanoseconds in after a further 0.3 nanoseconds from when this gate changed, that is 
as we go a further 0 0.3 nanoseconds. Uh, just to make it clear, this has the output equaling to 0. Up until here, it's been equaling to 1, and then also afterwards, it's equal to 1. Now this y equaling to 0 propagates all the way through, and we get this little, what we would call a glitch, for about 0.2 nanoseconds, where the output changes to 0 just for a very small amount of time, about 0.2 nanoseconds, and then after that 0 0.9 nanoseconds from when the select was originally changed from 1 to 0, then we have it giving the correct output of A. But just for that small amount of time, and that small amount of time is due to this 0.2 nanosecond delay of the inverter, then we had Y changing from 1 to 0, as in still showing the output of B, despite the fact that A was required. And this may cause some issues if we have these little glitches coming in due to timing. So these sort of issues with timing and delays is one very important issue that our studies of sequential logic will look to address. In the next lecture, we're going to be talking about storage elements, such as latches and flip-flops. So I'll see you then.